We live in a world when enough is hardly ever enough. Think about that with yourself. Ask yourself the question, when do I have enough? You've gotten a raise at your job and uh, the increase is there. Man, you're so excited for that because you're going to make more next year than you made this past year. And then you look at that and you get a few months into that year and you think, man, if I made that, that would be enough. And you get through that year and you think, I really need a raise because I spent what I had and enough wasn't enough. Remember that car, maybe that new car you got at one time. You got that car and you thought, man, I've got this car. I'll never need another car. But then the car ages. The home you moved into, you think this is our forever home. We'll always be in this home. This is the perfect home for us. And then things change and enough isn't quite ever enough. You know, the truth is we all kind of get onto our kids about that, but it's something that we all deal with. I'm Tim, and I'm on staff here at our church, and uh, I'm glad to be with you today uh, teaching this lesson from our series, Making Home Work. And, uh, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a biblical family in the middle of a secular society. And we want to help you make home work. And we believe God has a plan for your life to help your home thrive uh, when so many others are battling and, and, and all the things around them. So I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you are watching this as a parent or as a child or as an aunt or an uncle or what influence you have, but we all have influence. We all understand home in a different type of context, but home is something that all of us uh, are, are around, uh, that we have experienced or we are experiencing. We all have influence that we put towards an, an, a niece or a nephew or towards uh, maybe a cousin or a best friend or a daughter or a grandson, whatever it may be. Uh, we want to help you make home work. We're talking uh, this week about cultivating contentment in a consumerist culture. Cultivating contentment in a consumerist culture. If you do have kids, maybe you think back to yourself as a kid. Um, remember, you would watch the commercials, uh, you would watch the ads, uh, you would get something in the mail. Uh, as a kid for me, I used to love walking the aisles of Toys R Us. I would love doing that. Now, whenever my dad would go out of town, uh, my mom would take us and my brother and sister to Toys R Us, and that's something we would do in the e that evening. We would go, and it seemed like for hours, walk the aisles of Toys R Us. And we wouldn't even necessarily buy anything. We were making that birthday list or making that Christmas list. And we wanted this, and we wanted this, and we wanted this. And it was the, the most amazing place as a kid to be was walking the aisles of Toys R Us. And, you know, consumerism is something that consumes all of us. We're all involved in this consumerist culture. Um, you know, but the problem is when a child believes in their heart that their happiness and their identity are found in their possessions or in the acceptance that their possession gains them, man, there's a problem. What I find is that so much of what my kids do are the, the habits and the actions and things that they've learned, the attitudes they've learned from myself or from my wife. And we as parents have so much influence on our kids. If you think about your own family or different people around you, there's some people that you have influence over. And they're, they're watching what you do or what you don't do. They're watching the things that they're observing, what you like or, or how you face different circumstances uh, that are in life. I was reading some about uh, kids and how they're influenced by consumerism. Uh, brand loyalty, I read, is established as early as the age of two. Uh, from the study I read, it was that by, the eight, by first grade, so when a kid's six, seven years old, by first grade, most children can recognize 200 brand logos. I know our son, he can read now, he's entering, he's entering first grade. But even before he could read, he could pick up on certain things and recognize brand logos. And now uh, as a first grader, it's unbelievable how many different brand logos he, he, can, he sees and he can understand because they're all the time being advertised to. They're all the time looking around as they're driving around, they're doing those things. I read about how much kids um, influence a family. 
the study I read was that 97% of breakfast choices are influenced and made really by the kids. 95% of lunch choices. Where a family goes for casual meals, 98% of the time that's influenced by the kid. 34% of kids always have a say on where their family eats at a casual restaurant. Family entertainment choices, 98% of those choices uh, made or heavily influenced and made by the child. And then family trips or excursions, 94% of those uh, are influenced uh, by the kids. And so children have so much influence. Uh, they not only influence their parents' choices, but marketers influence children. And so we see this this just cycle here. And, and how can we instead cultivate contentment in their hearts? Consumerism is all around us. It's not going anywhere. It's part of our lives. But how do we face the culture we live in and we face that with contentment? How, how do we break the materialistic influences that are grabbing for all of our attention? See, it's not just marketers who teach us as consumers to be discontent and want more. It's the natural tendency of my heart and your heart to always want more, to always need that next thing. Um, you are, are maybe watching right now on a device. You're watching, I've got my phone with me right here. And uh, I, I have a phone and your phone comes out and it's, uh, you know, it's the 12 and you want the 13 that comes out or yeah, you have the, you have this version and version three comes out and you're still in version two. And the idea of the numbering system of versions is that you would need the next one because if not, you'll be left behind. We all have that fear of missing out in that situation. And so we want to make sure that we, we, right, we have the newest and the latest uh, and the greatest. And so what do we, we have to worry about several things. There's several myths, I think, that we want to shoot down concerning money and uh, possessions that we want to be careful not to perpetuate in our own lives and to our own uh, kids. Number one is that prosperity is a divine right. Now, prosperity is not a divine right. Prosperity is, is a gift. Um, there were great men in the Bible, women in the Bible, that they, they were very prosperous. There were those people. But there were also godly men and women in the Bible who were poor, and they did not have financial things. I mean, Jesus himself uh, talks about how, um, you know, the, the birds and the, have a place to, to rest, and the foxes have their holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So Jesus himself was not financially prosperous. We have to be careful not to assume that wealth is a sign of God's pleasure or that lean times are a sign of God's displeasure. We know that God's no respecter of persons. He tells us in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. These things, that phrase, when you literally go back and look there at the Greek, that it was written in in Matthew there, is referring to the, the basic necessities of life. He says, if you'll seek the kingdom of God first, follow him, the necessities of life, these things shall be added unto you. They'll be provided or given to you. Uh, so the first uh, myth there that we have to be careful about is prosperity is divine right. The second one is the myth of it's my money. It's my money. Well, that's actually wrong because if you're a child of God, we are stewards of what God has given us. We are stewards. A steward is a manager. Uh, a restaurant has a manager. He's not the owner. He's just the manager. The owner takes the place and says, hey, I'm going to put it in your hands to manage it. It's not your restaurant, but you need to take care of everything in it. And the owner has an expectation that the manager is going to run things properly. Uh, we are managers. James 1.17 reminds us that every good gift and every per perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights. And so all gifts that we have are from Him. It's my money is a myth. Another myth is that money is evil. That money's evil. Now this is a tricky one because it's close to the truth. But po possessing money is not a sin, but being possessed by money is a sin. So you can possess money and you're good to go. But if you are possessed by money, that's where the problem lies. Learning contentment isn't about hating money. It's about learning what matters most, about taking the, the needs and the things that God's given you to provide for those needs and to meet needs of others and using those properly. So how can we do these things? Let's look at several things I think will be helpful to us tonight as we are cultivating contentment in a consumerist culture. Now, number one is this, model contentment in the home. Model contentment in the home. All right, so what is contentment? 
Contentment is having enough. It's having enough. It's the opposite of covetousness. Covetousness says I always need more, but contentment recognizes that what I have is enough. 1 Timothy 6.6 6 actually says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So the godly who are content with who they are and what they have, there's great gain in that. But what does enough look like? Well, in plain terms, you could say it like this. Simply put, having enough is living below your means. Or even plainer, it's spending less than you bring in. The math there, if, you're, if your income is $10,000, your expenses are under $10,000. That's living with contentment. It's living below your means. It's living, uh, spending less than what you make. Truth is, sometimes it's probably good for us not to have. And that, that's especially true if it puts us in debt. It's always better not to have than it is to have and to be put into debt. Proverbs 22, 7, uh, the great verse on money in the Bible says, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is sl- servant to the lender. And so we don't want to be enslaved to anyone. We want to be a servant of Christ. Beyond that, we don't want to be in, in, in service to someone else. And so we have to be careful about guarding our, our service, who we're in service to, and, and the principles in the Bible of saving and of stewardship and of, and of management. Uh, Earl Wilson was a, a journalist, died back in the 80s, and he said this. It's a great statement. Nowadays, people can div- be divided into three classes. The haves, the have-nots, and the have-not paid for what they have. The haves, the have-nots, and the have-not paid for what they have. And so it'd be much better to be in the have-nots and not to have everything your friends have, than to be in the have not paid for what you ha- what for what you have. And um, our society, we live in an easy credit society, where we very easily can obtain credit to purchase things that we don't have, with things we can't afford. Right? Someone says something like, "Right, we all live trying to buy things we can't afford to please people we don't like, anyways." And uh, it's a dangerous cycle that we can 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 live in. And as you live below your means, what you do is you model to your kids this essence of contentment. You teach them that you don't have to have more stuff to be happy. You only need what God provides. 1 Timothy 6, 7, the Bible talks so much uh, about stewardship and money and finances. 1 Timothy 6, 7 says, we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and and, and raiment, it's clothing, let us be there with consent. What is it we exactly do we need these verses talk about? The point here is so much is that we not that we only need food and clothing. The point is contrasting contentment with covetousness. Wanting what we don't have and contrasting uh, just enjoying what we do have. One of the ways we cultivate this heart of contentment in our family and our children is we assure them that we will provide for their basic needs. Now, I never want my kids to wonder if they will be able to eat or be clothed, those kinds of things. And we can dump those things on parents, but sometimes there's, they're at an age where they're not ready to handle those kinds of things. While I want them to appreciate what uh, their mom and I provide for them, they're not really ready to understand all of the uh, intricacies of the financial system and the free market and all those kinds of things. We help them learn as they age and, and as is appropriate for their age. Um, what are the basic needs? We have, a, uh, we have a basic need for shelter. We have a basic need for food. We have a need for clothing. Uh, we have a need for education. And we also have a need for recreation. And uh, that can, that's where you live beyond your means. I think oftentimes we can go beyond our means. Excuse me, that's where we live within our means. We oftentimes can go beyond the means when it comes with some of those different areas. Uh, Recreation does not have to be paid events. This is us spending time with our kids. They have a need for that. When we, they know that we can meet the basic needs, I believe it lowers their expectation. Uh, It it, it helps them be more content in the things that they do have. They want me more than they want stuff. Now they enjoy stuff, but they really desperately need me. And how many kids, are trying to consume all of these other things because they're replacing what a mom or dad should be doing with quality with their kids. If we wanna teach 
contentment to our kids, we have to first model it ourselves in our home, what our children see. How content are, are we? How willing are we to be, uh, you know, a, a couple generations behind uh, on the latest phone? How willing are we to not always live with the car payment, but just have the car paid off and just drive it for what it is and understand that God's provided and it's paid off and be thankful for where we are with that. Uh, what is our contentment level? What's our expectation of our kids beyond what our own contentment level is ourselves? And so we want to make sure that we are uh, fostering this in our home. We are modeling contentment in the home. Not only do we want to model contentment in the home, but number two, we want to develop, we want to mentor workers in our home. We want our kids to have a good work ethic. Um, we, we live, and uh, this is true of any prosperous society in an entitlement culture. We are entitled to things we believe. Uh, but um, this, the goodness and all these things, man, those, those are things that we're not entitled to. Those are things that are provided to us. Proverbs 13, uh, verse 4 warns, The soul of the slugger desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. See, work is the means for our provision. God would have us to be workers. Second Thessalonians 3.10 sets up that principle that's it's really it's a strong principle where it says, for even when we were with, with you, this we command you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. The Bible makes it clear that work comes before provision. So we work and because we work, we have provision. You work and then you eat. And work is the means for the provision. Work is also ordained by God. Did you know that work was not a part of the curse of sin? Before Adam and Eve ever sinned, work was ordained in the Bible. Genesis 2.15 says the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And so Adam is working in the garden, dressing and keeping the garden, and they have not sinned yet. We've not seen the curse and all those things that don't happen in Genesis chapter 3. Work is already there. What sin did, it caused toil in work put the thorns in the ground. He said, there'll be sweat upon your brow. There'll be all those kinds of things. But work in and of itself is, is healthy. It's something that all of us need. It's very a positive thing in our lives. And we think of some of the people in the Bible, they were the top of their field. Um, think of Joseph, Samuel, and David. Those are three uh, really key Bible figures. They were at the top of their fields. I mean, they were really good workers in what they did. And so there's a number of people. I think of Lydia in the Bible. She was a seller of purple and God used her after she was saved and the church was started uh, there in Philippi. And Lydia was probably well known in the community as someone who sold this purple, made this purple. They were, they were good workers. The Bible's full of people. Paul partners with a couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who were tent makers so they could serve the Lord. And they, they, they were serving their community by making tents in their community. And they, had a, they had a work ethic about them. We want to make sure we are mentoring children, those under our care, as workers, because that way they can reap the benefit of work for their rest of their life. So mentor workers in the home. Thirdly here, let's make sure we are, uh, we are managing stewardship habits in the home. Manage stewardship habits in your home. Work is vital, but too many people are willing to work, but they don't reap the blessings of that work because they are not good stewards of what they earn from that work. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2 reminds us here, let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So we talked about earlier that we are stewards, we are managers. How faithful of a manager are you? Are you faithful with what has been given to you? See, attitudes towards money generally are learned. And children learn primarily from their parents. And they see how we love or don't love money. They see how we spend or don't spend money. We, they want and want and want little things uh, at the register, candy and, uh, or chocolate candy bar or a little toy. They want those things and we say no. But then we are always guilty of picking up little snacks here and there and those little things. And we're, we're teaching by what we are doing. Even if parents do not intentionally teach those habits, we are observed. P 
people are watching you, and then we're often copied. So what is it that we should be teaching that would be beneficial as we're teaching stewardship in the home? Well, I believe the first priority of that stewardship is the priority of putting God first, and that is teaching in our giving, in our giving. See, generosity is not something, and management of, of money is not something we're taught at 16 and 18 years old when they get a first job. It's something that's taught at a very young age. Generosity begins when a child first learns to give to the Lord. And as he gives, he's going to learn firsthand that it is more blessed to give than to receive. As they, they give their own finances, their own jobs and things they may do, as they give towards a sibling and, and in giving towards them, uh, they've, they've shown that they can do for others, not just be done for themselves. And we are to teach giving. Hey, we are to teach budgeting. Right? We're, we're to teach them the importance of managing their own stuff and saving. I, I think of back when I picked up my first job, I, I cut grass uh, for, a, for an older lady. And, and I cut her grass and um, I, I got paid, of course, for cutting the grass. And I remember what my parents did. They said, all right, we're going to, first of all, you're going you're to tithe off that. You're going you're gonna to give to the Lord. And then we want you to save half of what you earn and you're going to put that in the bank. And what they were doing is they didn't set me up for to be a millionaire by the time I was 50 or anything like that by that. It wasn't a, this extraordinary amount of money. They taught me the principle there of managing my money first to the Lord and then to save some and then to do with the other what I could. And I know things can get tight. I understand that and, and, and I can identify with you and be empathetic with you in those situations. And, and when they do, man, we really have to buckle up. We, we always, though, have to understand giving is first. And as we glorify God, all these things shall be added into us. He will meet the needs that we have. And we understand, though, anything we do have left there, we take care of. We make sure that we are properly managing what we have with wisdom and with purpose. Uh, we, we do that. Maybe you need to take uh, do some budgeting. There's, there's, a, there's a tool called Every Dollar that you could use. That's a free app that helps you budget out what you're doing. I believe it's everydollar.com. There's also the app that you can download and a list of other um, budgeting tools where you can take what you're taking in and say, all right, where's every one of those dollars going to go? And let's figure out what our budget is, what your method. A lot of methods are there. It's just the method that's best for you is the method that you actually work, right? Teach budgeting, teach saving, teach saving. Uh, it does require sacrifice, just like giving. Maybe we got to cut here and there, but we learn that we need to save and we set up um, the best we can to be able to afford to uh, go through any accidents or any emergency funds. And, and the Lord, Lord's help, we try to do that. And we work hard to make money so we don't just blow that money, but so we budget, we save. But, but spending is just important. Really, the most important aspect for saving is the aspect of spending. I'm buying what I need and not always buying what I want buying what I need to have and not always what I want to have. And so as I control my spending, I can help control my saving. And the areas of the principles of stewardship and giving and budgeting and saving and in spending are important things that we pass on. Maybe you've been blessed and you can pass those on. You can show those things. Maybe you struggle and you go, man, I don't want my kid to struggle like I've struggled. Even though I don't have much to save right now, I'm going to teach them how to save. So as they go and they get a job and those kinds of things, uh, they can benefit uh, from some things that I was not able to benefit from. And they need to see us practicing biblical financial stewardship ourselves. And then we need to teach them how to manage these, these basic habits of godly stewardship. Let's teach them how that. Let's mentor them uh, in their work ethic. Let's help them manage their stewardship. Let's also teach Number four, let's maintain biblical priorities in our home. Maintain biblical priorities in our home. These are some priorities here that we want to maintain. And I believe if we'll maintain these priorities, then we can make homework, right? We can, we can do this here. We can make this homework. We can uh, produce a godly family in the middle of a secular society. What are the biblical priorities in your home that we must maintain? Number one, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Learn that he is always trustworthy because he's always faithful and he's always the same. 
And the same God he was yesterday is the same God he'll be today, the Bible says, and it's the same God that he'll be forever. The heart of biblical contentment is just that. It's that God is enough and that he will provide for our needs. Maybe you need to know that today. You need to hear that. Christ is enough. That he will help you. You're facing a tough situation at a job right now. You've got a bill that's got to be paid. It's a, it's a difficult situation. How much are you trusting in him? Are you trusting him so much you put him up first in your finances? If you haven't put him first in your finances, then Malachi asks, will a man rub God? And he says, well, yeah, you've robbed me in your, in, your, in your tithes and your offerings. So if I'm not giving, I'm not showing, I'm trusting. It's one thing to, to serve him with my lips. It's another thing to actually do that with my accounts, with the actions that I have. You trust in the Lord. You allow and follow his plan. But not only trust in the Lord, how about we serve the Lord? Let's serve him. As a parent, you can help mold and model this biblical priorities of trusting in the Lord and then of your service to others by doing both, by both yourself and by creating opportunities for your kids to participate as well. Man, is there cost involved in serving sometimes? Man, there is. There's energy. I know we all have a finite amount of energy, a finite amount of time, and a finite amount of money. I know all those kinds of things. But we'll never regret putting God first, making sure we're in the house of the Lord, making sure that we're, we're, we're a part of a local body of believers. Man, everyone needs to be a part of a local church. Local church where you can grow together with those people. As you sit under the Bible preaching from a pastor who opens the, the Bible and encourages you and challenges you in God's word. I hope inside of your local church. I know for me it's a, a group of believers, some other couples. We call our class together. And these couples were together and we study God's word together. And we, we learn and we grow and we pray for each other. I need that. I need the accountability myself from the word of God myself as I read God's word, as I can bring my request to him. Let's serve the Lord. And, but the benefits outweigh the cost. You trust in the Lord and you serve the Lord. And then you pass that on to those that you have influence around you. And you will not regret what God will do with that. Because children who learn the principles that we talked about, the skills that we talked about, as they enter adulthood with a financial and a social, a spiritual maturity beyond their years, then they're going to begin their adult lives with principles and with habits that will help their relationships. It'll transform their careers. It'll change their marriages. Their ministry opportunities to others will be revolutionized. Best of all, most of all, it's because they will have contentment. They will always have enough. You know, we live in a society where often we are told that you are enough. I am enough. But the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus Christ, he is enough. And all of my contentment can be found in in him. We are trying to cultivate contentment in a consumerist culture. Let's check our own lives right now. How content am I? I believe that contentment is tied to how in tune am I with God? Am I putting him first in my life? Am I trusting him? And I am I serving him? And if we're not trusting him and we're not serving him, then we're probably looking all over for contentment. And we're spending, we're buying, we're using energy, and we're doing all kinds of things trying to find contentment. Contentment is found in Jesus Christ, knowing that He is enough. I hope that's been a challenge and a blessing to you. Um, and if it has and you've missed some of these other lessons, this has been a whole series of lessons that we'd love for you to join us and be a part uh, of. You can find more of these lessons on making home work. If you check out our Beacon Baptist Church YouTube page, you can find more of these uh, series of lessons. You can also find them on our Facebook page 
as well. And you can catch up. If this has been a blessing to you, it helped you, go ahead and click share and, and invite others that they can watch this as well. Let them know they can watch this uh, and they can be a part of this series as we're studying making home work. And uh, maybe God's spoken to your heart somewhere. There's some way we can even pray for you. Feel free to put that in the comments there uh, so we can reach out and pray with you over whatever situation may be going on in your life. Thank you so much for being a part of this. We are live uh, here on Facebook and on YouTube uh, every uh, Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and then on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. And I hope you'll join us again as we continue to help make home work. And as you go about your day and your week, may the Lord bless you. May He keep you. May He be gracious unto you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace.